Communion Sunday, and we will be having communion. This is also Peace and Global Witness Offering Sunday, and as we have mentioned before, 25% of the Peace and Global Witness Offering stays here in this church, and we have decided to give our portion to my sister's place, which um, is very deserving and they do need the money. Please join me in the call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that you may be known upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. And let all the peoples praise you. The, Euro, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. And let all the peoples praise you. Our first hymn today is all people that on earth do dwell. It is found on page 220 of the blue hymnal.
confession. Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. This is the word of the Lord. Come, confess your sins if you long to be redeemed. This morning, our confessions will be done in silence. Hear the good news, my friends, of the assurance of pardon. Jesus accompanies us on life's journey, offering abundant mercy, bountiful forgiveness along the way. This is good news. Friends, believe the good news. The Lord is our hope and our trust, our light and our salvation. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. I'm going to invite you to pass peace to one another. When Jesus left his disciples, he did not leave them alone. He promised that the Holy Spirit would be present in their lives. He gave them an amazing gift, his peace, the peace of Christ. I invite you to turn to those around you and offer Christ's peace, gifts with these words. The peace of Christ is yours today. The peace of Christ is yours today. <clears throat> Let me say something now, but before we come to the prayer for illumination, a little poem by a Native American poet, Nancy Wood, in a little book called Many Winters, as we get ready to enter the uh, winter season here on the coast. A number of questions that could have been asked by children, I suppose, could be asked by anyone. It goes like this. You shall ask, what good are dead leaves? And I will tell you, they nourish the sore earth. You shall ask, what reason is there for winter? And I will tell you, to bring about new leaves. You shall ask, why are the leaves so green? And I will tell you, because they are rich with life. You shall ask, why must summer end? And I will tell you, so the leaves can die. Think about that one. Oh. Join me um, in the prayer for illumination this morning, if you would. Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I got a call from Wendy on Friday asking if I would fill in on short order since uh, Pastor Mark had to be in San Francisco. So I looked at the calendar and I said yes. But I am going to change the uh, reading of the scripture this morning. It says World Communion Sunday. So I tried to pick out a text and a sermon that would go along a little better with World Communion Sunday. So I'm reading from the sixth chapter of John, and I think you'll see the connection with the bread and the cup this morning. 
Listen as the Spirit leads for the Word of God. The next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and they went to Capernaum to look for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Presbyterian Pastor Ted Ward once told a story about a slicked up church supply salesman came in in a three-piece suit to his office, church office. He wanted to try to sell him some Bible games for the youth group. The top of the line game was something called Dollars and Cents, S-E-N-S-E, Dollars and Cents. It was a board game, something like Monopoly. And the salesman said it's a great teaching tool about Christian economics. And the way the game worked was if the players land on a square named middle level executive, they received a great sum of money. But if they were lucky enough to land on the square labeled company president, they got an even larger sum of money. And regardless of the amount of money they received, however, they gave 10% to the church on the church board square. And here's, I guess, where the alleged lesson of, lesson of Christian economics came in. They would reap a bonanza if they landed on the shower of blessings square. If you landed on the shower of blessings square, you got all the money that was in the game's jackpot. Well, Pastor Wardlow, to say the least, was not very impressed by this game. He said to the salesman, you know, I think that's a rather crass lesson to try and teach a child, that the word blessings is so easily associated with the word jackpot. But the salesman was ready for him. He didn't flinch. He looked the pastor straight in the eye, Professor Wardlaw, and he said, yes, Reverend, but isn't that the way the world works? And yes, I suppose that is the way the world works. We say we're hungry for a blessing, but sometimes what we really are hungry for is the jackpot. Blessings come as a sign of grace. They're gifts. They deepen and enrich in our, spiritual, our humanity. Jackpots, on the other hand, are sort of a sign of luck. They're windfalls. They give us more of what most people seem to be after. A little bit of fame, look at the jackpot I won. A little bit of power and some fortune. A child in the public school system here in Lincoln County who has a passionate and caring teacher that child has received a blessing. A high roller in the casino, up the road here a little piece in Lincoln City, who comes up big at the roulette table. That's not a blessing. That's a jackpot. 
And sadly, given the choice, some of us would just as happily trade the passion of learning for a few lucky strikes at the roulette table. Yes, Reverend, the salesman said, that's the way the world works. The preference for jackpots over blessings is an easy one to spot, of course, when it comes full force and undisguised. The picture of the Wall Street financiers working leverage buyouts for companies whose employees they neither know nor care about, simply to line their pockets with more cash. Yeah, you can sort of decipher what that's all about. They may say being in the right place at the right time to find an opportunity was a real blessing. But it's not a blessing. It's a jackpot, pure and simple. Despite the fact that no one has ever confessed on his or her deathbed, you know, I wish I had worked harder on weekends. I wish I'd spent more time in my office. I wish I'd spent less time with my children and grandchildren. I wish I'd poured more of myself in the pursuit of my career. The fact is that countless of us do or did at some time probably do some of those things. Hustling at warp speed right past life's blessings on our way for that elusive jackpot. Yes, Reverend, salesman said, that's the way the world works. And it's fairly easy to spot. However, it's more difficult to tell the difference between the hunger for a blessing and the lust for a jackpot when it takes a religious form. Take, for example, the crowds described in our gospel reading today from John. <clears throat> They've been fed by Jesus. They're among those 5,000 up there on the hillside that Luke talks about. And now they followed him. They've gotten in boats. They've gone over to Capernaum to see where he's gone to. And at first, when we read the story, we're sort of impressed by their spiritual earnestness. They want to be close to Jesus, they say. They're thirsting for his teaching. They long to deepen their encounter with God. In short, the crowd seems to be hungry for a blessing. But when you read a little more closely, actually, no, maybe that's not what they're after after all. And Jesus seems to discern their true motives. And he calls it as he sees it. He says, you're not looking for me because of the signs of God's presence. You're looking for me because you got well fed with those 5,000 up on the hillside. In other words, you're not looking for a blessing. You're in for the jackpot. Now we have to be careful here. This is not a simplistic story that Luke is telling. This is not the crass account of people who got their beliefs filled up and care nothing about the life of faith. This is not about people who came to church for the potluck supper and not the preaching, who showed up in the sanctuary to make business contracts rather than to open the hymnal and sing praises. Not at all. This crowd believes that it is following Jesus for good and true religious reasons. After all, when they'd all been fed on the hillside, they said of Jesus in one voice, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. So why is it that Jesus is challenging their motives as they followed him all the way to Capernaum? I think in the first place, Jesus perceives that the crowd is following him because they believe he can make their lives better. But, he, but he, they want him to make their lives better on their terms. Jesus wants to give them a life. They just want an improved lifestyle. A number of years ago, a new pastor starting out in the ministry managed to save a few dollars out of his first paycheck. And he decided, you know, maybe the wise thing for me to do is go down and invest in the stock market. He wasn't very experienced in such things. So he walked into his local branch of Merrill Lynch office and asked the receptionist about an investment. And she looked at him, she quickly sized up that this minister, she didn't know he was a minister at the time, probably was a small account. So she shuttled him off to the greenest broker in the place. And evidently the novice broker had been trained to make a little sweet talk, a little small talk at the beginning with a new customer. 
So he asked the walk-in customer, what do you do for a living? The fellow said, I'm a minister. I'm the pastor of a church. And the young stockbroker's face turned a little pale. He was thinking to himself, give me a lawyer, give me a dentist, give me a life insurance agent, give me anything but a minister, he seemed to be thinking. What can I say to a minister? And finally he thought about it a little bit and something came to him and he said, you know, I read the Bible when the market's down. And he felt good about being able to say that. So there it is. That's the confusion between a blessing and a jackpot. The broker no doubt thought he was doing a righteous thing, reading the Bible when the Dow Jones was tanking, going down. But the assumption was that religion's task, or worse, God's job, is to make his life better as a broker, to hold together him's life together when the market falters, even to turn the bear market into bull markets. And sometimes I think we do the same thing when we assume that God's role is to make life the life that we have designed for ourselves and planned for ourselves, work a little better, run a little smoother. Oh God, we say, I have got some great plans. Now will you help me make them work? That's not a blessing. That's a jackpot. Jesus is not a short order cook preparing food to suit our whims. He offers not the food that perishes, but the food that endures for eternal life. And that food that endures for eternal life, of course, is Jesus himself. He tells the crowd, I am the bread of life. This is not perishable bread that feeds on a passing whim. This is the nourishment of God that feeds our souls. This is the bread that God gives us as a gift. When the crowd continued to be confused about this, they asked Jesus, what do we need to perform? How do we, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus said, in effect, you cannot perform the work of God. The work of God will transform you, but you cannot perform it. God performs the work of God. You just have to believe it and receive it and live it. There was a story not too long ago about a rabbi who died in England. And his obituary told the story about his life. <clears throat> when he was a young boy, he and his family were imprisoned in a Nazi death camp. And in the camp, the prisoners were given just barely enough food to survive. They had a little bit of grain, a little bit of stale bread, a few grams of lard every week. And despite their harsh environment, this boy's family continued to observe the Sabbath. They somehow managed to scrounge up a little piece of candle, a little bit of food each week, and they said the Sabbath prayers and pronounced the Sabbath blessings. One week, however, there was no candle. So when the evening came, the Sabbath was at hand, the boy's father took some of their precious little lard and wrapped it around a little bit of string. And lighting the makeshift candle, he began to lead the family in prayers and blessings. And after that, his son was quite enraged. When the prayers were done, he confronted his father. How could you do that? How could you waste what little lard we have to make a candle? That's the only food we have. And his father answered, son, without food, we can live for several days. Without hope, we cannot live for an hour. Do not work for the food that perishes, Jesus said, but for the food that endures for eternal life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we suffer from many hungers. We come to you seeking to be fed. We hope to be filled with all that our hearts desire. Give us, feed us, bless us, heal us. But Lord Jesus, come to us not as we would have you to be, but come to us the way you really are. 
Lift our desires above our mere bodily needs. Lift us up toward your kingdom. Feed us, Lord. Be for us that bread of life that satisfies always. May it be so. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to change our hymn this morning. It's going to be a hymn 506, I believe it is, in the blue hymnal, 507. I want to tell you a little bit about the author of the hymn, Brian Wren. We have about 11 of his hymns in the blue hymnal. About the same number of hymns, I think, in the new Presbyterian Glory to God hymnal as well. Brian Wren was born in 1936. He's 86 years old. As far as I know, he's still with us. And he was professor of worship at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia for a number of years. He was born just outside London. He remembers his earlier memories are of the air raid sirens, the drones of the German bombers coming over, the anti-aircraft fire, and bombs exploding all around London where he was. He's a writer, he's a preacher, worship and worship leader. He's an internationally known and published hymn poet. And you'll find his work in denominational hymnals in North America, Britain, Australia. He's an ordained minister in the United Reformed Church. <clears throat> Several years ago, I was doing some summer work down to San Francisco Theological Seminary for three months. And we went to chapel every Sunday, every day, every morning. And lo and behold, there was a 48-year-old fellow there who was leading the worship. And it was Brian Wren, the fellow who has written our hymn this morning. He was 48 at the time. He's 86 now, as I mentioned. His uh, partner in marriage is the Reverend Susan Hayfield. She a um, Methodist minister and served the United Methodist Church in New England Conference for a number of years. She's now retired. And in retirement, both of them are now working together. They're still writing music together. I think they still attend music conferences from time to time. This hymn I like, I Come With Joy. He's revised it two times. If you're a hymn writer and you live long enough, you get to revise your own hymns as times change. It's a privilege you don't always get. The one you have in the blue hymnal was revised in 1977. I think he revised the one that's in the Glory to God Presbyterian hymnal about 1983. So he's gone through two revisions. We're going to sing the second revision here. This text affirms that Christian unity is not an achievement. It's a gift, what we've been talking about in the sermon. It's one that's renewed every time we gather around the Lord's table. We come in in the hymn and it says, I, as we enter, but when we go out from the Lord's table, the pronoun is we, it changes from I to we. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free. The life of Jesus to recall his love laid down for me, his love laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near to find that all are fed. The new community of love and Christ's communion bread. And Christ's communion bread. Together met, together bound by all that God has done. We, notice, no, no longer I, will go with joy to give the world the love that makes us one. The love that makes us one. Let's sing this marvelous hymn together. Now that you know a little bit about Brian and his uh, motives for writing it. Yeah. 
Amen. I thought I saw some announcements up here. I assume these are current. Let's see. It says 10-1. Well, today's 10-2. That's close enough, isn't it? Oh, this is a little announcement that 36 were served breakfast, 34 boxes were given out, which served 90 people, and 38 households. I assume that was for last week. That sounds great. Thank you for your faithfulness to that ministry. We come to the time of prayers of the people, and there are some prayers listed in your worship bulletin this morning. Uh, for Jerry Caldwell, as he recovers from back surgery, for Jody and his daughter-in-law, further cancer treatments, Chuck and Sylvia for some life decisions that they're making, Mickey Millett for health, and Peter Schultz for health. And I had an other announcement here someplace too. Where did that go? It was for Nikki, I think. Does that sound right? Someone came this morning whose wife was under the weather. You want to say something? We'll pray for her. I, uh, I had that written down and I don't know where it disappeared to. Well, I'm sorry, not Nikki, it's Nina. Nina Topher, does that sound right? We'll put in our prayers this morning. She's not feeling well. I uh, want to remember Pastor Mark in our, fam in our prayers this morning. As mentioned in the announcement, he's had a death in the family. He's down in the San Francisco area. I want to certainly remember the good folks in the Florida coast who've gone through Hurricane Ina, Iva. Uh, Ina, get it right in a minute. If you've seen the television pictures of that, it's unbelie unbelievable. I have a friend who's down in the Fort Myers area has a condo on the ninth floor which survived on the first floor was completely wiped out and if you look at the pictures of that beach down there around fort myers it is just completely devastated that surge tide was probably 10 12 feet and it just wiped the beach clean that's going to be a long long time coming back and we pray for all the good folks that are working so hard down there this morning Hurricane went on, of course, picked up speed again, it's hit South Carolina as a Category 1 hurricane a couple days later. And uh, not as bad, but they had quite a bit of flooding there. I want to remember the folks uh, in Ukraine and this war that doesn't seem to want to end and the terrible cruelties that are going on there. Pray for peace for all of those folks. I'm going to change the response slightly from what's in the bulletin today. I'm going to invite you in parts of the prayer here where I say, Lord, in your mercy, invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we live in a troubled world, a world that's racked by things we cannot control like the weather. And people are quite astounded this morning as they go back to see what's left of their homes to find that some of them have washed out to sea in the Gulf of Mexico. The ones that are standing have been completely flattened and they don't even recognize the streets they live on anymore. We pray for all of these folks and for all the volunteers and government workers and others who are working to find those. Some have perished. I think there are over 37 people last I saw who lost their lives and probably others to be found. It's going to be a long haul for these folks. We pray that you will surround them with your spirit this morning, with the kindness of strangers and neighbors, and to help them reorganize a world that has completely vanished in this terrible hurricane, Ian, that came along. God of tears, you are the giver of joy. Hear us as we pray this morning for those who are sick or sick of heart. We pray for those with chronic illness, for those who have life-threatening conditions, for those with inadequate medical care. Bring the healing we need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we pray for those who are hungry this morning. We pray for those who live in regions of drought and famine, for those who cannot afford nutritious food, 
and for the vulnerable who are not adequately fed, give us the food, the imperishable food we need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who mourn for a loved one, particularly from this passing hurricane. For those whose communities are no more, which is the case for many of these Florida beachside places. And for those who cannot imagine a joyful future, give us comfort to restore hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us when we pray for the world's victims. We pray for those who are caught in violence in so many countries around the world. Much violence in our own country as well. More mass shootings this year in the United States than we can count. For those who are trapped in others' self-seeking. For those who suffer from neglect. Grant us freedom from all evil. Lord, in your mercy. God of the poor and the poor in spirit, we pray for your help against all that oppresses as we look forward to the kingdom that you have promised and are bringing even now through Jesus Christ, in whose name our prayers are offered this morning. We ask this in all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our hope, invites us to join our voices and spirits in the prayer that he teaches, has taught us, and generations of faithful disciples before us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to um, the offering. Most of you probably dropped that in the box on the way in. We'll have a little... Um, I assume we'll probably stand for the doxology for that next. I'm a little lost in the program here. Does that sound about right? Let's do that. Give thanks for God's offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, creatures here below. Praise Him above ye. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Gracious God, bless these good gifts. Bless the givers, too, for generous hearts and good spirits. Bless all who are sharing their good out of their goodness with those who have suffered these tragedies in these last few days in parts of our country and around our world. We give you thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to keep Pastor Mark has prepared a hymn to call us to the Lord's table this morning. It's to the same hymn tune as our opening hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. So let's prepare to sing that as we're invited to God's table this day.
friends, is this the table of the Lord prepared for those who hunger and thirst for the bread which does not perish, for the presence and life of our Lord Jesus Christ? It shall come from east and west on this World Communion Sunday, from north and south, to gather at a table much like this one around our world to give thanks to our Lord, to be nourished, and to be sent out as apostles of the good news of Jesus Christ. The mystery of this place is indeed Christ is dead, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. You remember on Easter morning there were two disciples walking on that little road to Emmaus, some 30 miles or so from Jerusalem. A stranger came alongside them and he acted like he did not know what had been going on in Jerusalem. Someone had been crucified there. And he opened the word to them and told them why these things had to happen. From the word of the Old Testament, the biblical testament, and what had just transpired. And when they got to Emmaus, it was getting dark. They invited to come in and have dinner with them. And when he sat down at the table with them, he broke bread. And their eyes were open. And they knew it was their risen Lord. On that last night, as Jesus said in that upper room with his disciples, he took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for forgiveness of sins. So often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember me until I come again. I think you have a little packet there that you can open up on the one side for the bread. If I should do that and partake of it. And then flip it over and take the little seal off on the other side to reveal the juice. And I invite you to take a bit. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ poured out for you. Join me in the prayer after communion, put it in your bulletin of chili and grace. Let us pray together. For this bread, for these gifts, we praise you, God. Amen. Now we get to sing again this uh, Come Sup with God, this little hymn that uh, Pastor Mark has put in the bulletin. Same hymn tune. Um, let's sing it again together.
granted love for all, may the Redeemer of all, granted grace among all, may the Helper of 